Okay, <laughs> you caught me at a funny face. Praise God, we're back. We're going to do the third part of this White Grace series, and we're going to wrap this one up because it, it, it is deep, and I'm glad it, it was explored over a few parts. So, not going to explain what we did before for the, for the sake of time, but we're just grateful that we're able to look at grace and all that Jesus has done for us to provide that for. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic. So let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory and praise. We honor you. We worship you. Pray again that you just come upon us, Holy Spirit, to touch the deepest depths of everyone's heart, to see what grace really means to them personally. Because yes, Lord, it is a personal walk, and you are doing that walk in them, and you have the personal word for each and every one of us. And that is what we deeper pray, mostly a deeper awareness and revelation of your love, of our need for you, and the deepest depths of the pain to be healed in our hearts, so that it will be your life in us, lived through us, that people will see. Thank you, Lord. And for those who are not Christians, I pray they see their need for you and will accept you as Lord and Savior, all because of your grace. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so we saw how much Jesus loves us. It's just remarkable. I'll be reading again from the book. Are you under law or under grace? Being free to love God daily. I mean, that's critical. You think about that. Being free to love God daily. book I wrote a few years ago after an extensive study on law and grace because it, it's, so, it's so misunderstood and so misapplied. And the next, see, the next lesson will be on can law and grace be mixed. So we're really going to look at that and look at legalism really going to dig into the Word of God itself. Amen. But let's let's finish this one up to see what is so needed here. Because we see that this free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So with all the love and richness God has provided through Jesus, how could one not fall in love with Jesus every day? His love and richness await you every day. And if he already lives in you, it's already there, the love and the richness. So Jesus certainly has unconditional love and acceptance for every person. The Apostle Paul exemplifies this so well in his letter to the Philippians. I'm just going to read this. It's Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it was robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and had been found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. See, Jesus has done it all. He came out of heaven. He left eternity and came into time, our time. Lived like us, became the form of a servant, died for our sins. And now God has risen him from the dead, restored that human relationship with us. If you accept his free gift invitation of eternal life. But we see Jesus as God will be highly exalted in every tongue, shall confess and every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's King to the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so here's a good saying I like to read. Jesus gave up his life as man in death in order to share his resurrected life as God in us now. What Christian would not desire to have this intimate love daily? It makes no sense at, not to. So Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God that was slain for every sin ever committed. Apart from him, I could never enter into the presence of a holy God. It means instant death to, f to stand in his presence in my own righteousness. My flesh, sin nature, could never do this. However, now I can stand in the righteousness of Jesus because his righteousness is my righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read the last lesson. God cleanses me of all sins and unrighteousness, makes me as white as snow, and places my sin behind his back and throws them in the sea. 
throws your sins in, into the sea, forgetting them. Hallelujah. You know, there's a song that I always remember that Helen Baylor would sing. It's called The Sea of Forgetfulness. And it says, some of the lyrics are, 70 times 7, Jesus keeps forgiving and cleansing us of all our sins. Excellent song to meditate on. If you look, if you look it up, probably on YouTube, "The Sea of Forgetfulness" by Helen Baylor. So, if God for continuously forgives us and cleanses us, no wonder it becomes natural to love Jesus back and embrace this love. Again, what word can describe this? Grace. Don't deserve it, but look at all that God does for us. It's it's remarkable. And this is one thing Satan doesn't want Christians to see. Who they really are as a child of God walking in his grace. He said he'll just want to try and distract us and drown us by guilt. Especially trying to live under the law. So as we reflect often on the grace of God and how his grace applies to our salvation in Jesus. We are challenged with the following questions. What is next after grace? And... How do we live by grace once we are saved by grace? So the answers are found in the second letter of the Apostle Peter. It's mentioned right at the end. It says in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory hath now and forever. Amen. So we grow in grace. Amen. The, these are the last words written by Peter, and he makes it very simple. Grace is only growing in love into a deeper, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. Gro Grace is only growing in love into a deeper, intimate relationship with Jesus. Because grace is Jesus Christ. Grace is basically the essence of God himself. How could anything be so obvious? Jesus is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. We see that in Revelations 1.8. And he's also everything in between. He truly is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. John 14.6. Jesus is the only reason for life. Wow. Jesus is the very person of God himself manifested in human form as the Son. Everything is summed up in him and is complete in him. Colossians 1.19. Everything was created by Jesus, for him, and through him. Romans 11.36, Colossians 1, 16, 17. So really, you can't get more specific about life than Jesus Christ. So when you think about grace, all you think about is Jesus Christ and all he's done for you. So have you received him into your heart to live as personal Lord and Savior? If not, I pray you ask him right now. Repent of your sins and ask him to come raise you from spiritual death to spiritual life, the life that Adam lost. Amen. We praise God for that. And if he does live in you, he wants to live through you. I mean, we've just seen he's everything. I'll repeat this again. He's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. He's manifested as the very person of God in human form, as the Son of God. He walked this earth, faced everything we did, was tempted in every way, yet without sin. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead, leaving the sins there and the consequences. And now he offers a free gift of eternal life. Everything is summed up in him and is complete in him. Everything was created by him, for him, and through him. So you, it all comes down to Jesus Christ. Grace is Jesus Christ. And we, as Peter says, when we grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's growing in that personal, intimate relationship. Don't miss this point. It's not about doing things, keeping God's commandment. It's growing in his love. And as we'll see further as we look at this, love becomes the primary motivation. Paul writes, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the end of the law. So are you living under law or living under grace? We want to live under grace. The problem is many mix the two. And we're really going to expose this fallacy, this error, that the Christian life is lived totally under grace. Law is important, but once law shows us our sinful, evil nature, it points us to a Savior. 
Jesus Christ. And we're really going to look into that as we get into the next sessions about can you mix law and grace. So we really want to give God a great praise. Here's another verse too to help you grow in the grace and knowledge. In Colossians 3, 3 and 4 says, Our life is hidden with Christ in God, and Christ who is our life. So if Christ is my life, and if I want to get to know me, whom should I get to know? Jesus. Christ. So as you read and meditate the Word of God, have an open heart. Silently, humbly ask the Father to make Jesus more personal in your heart at this present moment. Hallelujah. Be silent and still and just be convinced that everything lives to Jesus. So that's going to conclude our point on why grace. As we see, it's only because of His grace. And now we're going to continue with the next video looking at looking at the Word of God, specifically Old Covenant Law and New Covenant Grace. Can law and grace be mixed? We're going to look at the, we're going to look at the book of Romans, not the whole book, but a lot of key scriptures that point about law and grace, and it's a lot. Then we're going to look at the Acts 15, I call the First Grace Conference, where this legalism was really challenged, where at the time it was believed, yes, where salvation is only in Jesus' name, but there was some from the Pharisee camp who became Christian and said now that the now that the Gentiles and non Jews were became Christians, they must now be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. That's mixing law and grace, so freedom really put in. And then we're gonna look at the book of Galatians, where Paul really exposed this fallacy. So this grace plus gospel, like I like to call it, is not. And God's really gonna expose it. I'm gonna be so dependent on him. So can law and grace be mixed? Never. The grace plus gospel is an error from the pit of hell. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We love the, seeing the importance of the law. We love seeing what grace really is, growing in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. What a joy. We thank you and praise you and look forward for the next series. Yes, Lord, we lift you up. Amen. So what a joy it's going to be. What a joy it really will be as we look further at the studies growing in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And we are using the Word of God. Even though I'm reading from a book I wrote, it is so much Scripture we will be looking at that it's right there. Amen. Let's say, I just want to, in my heart to pray one more prayer before our next study. Dear Lord, we love you and cherish you so much. We are nothing without you. Therefore, Lord, Jesus, with total dependence on your love and on your grace, we ask you now to open our hearts and eyes to which to what you desire to teach us about law and grace. Come, Holy Spirit, burn the love of Jesus into us. Glorify Jesus in our lives. Amen. Amen. Be in prayer. Understand the depths of this. Read the previous, excuse me, watch the previous videos that are out there because we're really going to get involved with this. Can law and grace be mixed? No. Glory to God. Amen. Take care.